Good afternoon, David Castleton. Today with yeah. us. Afternoon, Alicia. Well, even in here in England. I know you don't have evening in Spain, but um no, we do, we do, we yeah. do. It's just very light, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Still, it's still not night time, so yeah, it's afternoon for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Yeah. So yeah, we'll have to test your Spanish. Mm, oh, don't think I do that. So rusty. <laughs> it's been so long since I spoke Spanish. Yeah. Hace mucho tiempo. Yeah. Ah, but you haven't forgotten. I'm sure that you still can. There's a little bit back there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So we have we have here the the a different profile. Well, welcome to Alice in Gothic Land. And yeah. Happy to section. be here. Thank you. This is the section talking to the author that I created. And uh, yes, you've got a bit of a different profile to other writers because you used to teach Spanish. Uh, sorry, you used to teach English in Spain. Yeah. At so, one point, yeah. At some point. So that's very good. We were talking about this before opening mm -hmm. the microphone and, and really it's very interesting for me because we have a similar profile. Mm -hmm. So even though you are from the English native side and I'm from the second language learner teaching, mm -hmm. uh, we can see in when you were saying when we write or when you write that it's very handy to have mm -hmm. the language. Mm. And also, I would say that when you're teaching the language to have the literary background is very mm. useful as well. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So, well, the first thing, I'm going to uh, change the screen. Okay. So then we're going to start talking first about your baby book that you've got, if I can call it baby, baby book. Well, this is us. There you it's go. A, it's <laughs> a little slim baby. Yeah. Yeah. A slim baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to reduce this screen. So this is us. Look. <laughs> right so with a lovely uh, misty gothic background yeah that's right yeah. yeah because your books well when we get to your mm. first book there's so many there's so many gothic elements there that is yeah. amazing and we, we're gonna talk about them later but let's start yeah. with the baby new baby that you've got on the market yeah. so what can you tell us about it well, it, well it's doing well yeah you said uh, um, pretty, pretty well so far, more better than I expected. Um, it hit number one in um, three categories on Amazon UK. Um, I'm not sure how big the categories are, so I don't know how many books were sold, but uh, I got that little orange bestseller sticker on Amazon, which <laughs> I never yeah. thought I'd get, so uh, that was quite a nice feeling. Um, yeah, so it's a little slim book um, about weird stuff in churches and churchyards in, in Britain um it's also pretty gothic uh have you read it Alicia? yes look look, yes. look, look, look okay look, 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 look. of course i did I okay did. So, yes, i do my own work before interview with people if not i, I look stupid okay <laughs> no, so but, um yeah. so, so I, I i tried to kind of make it as kind of gothic as i as i could really because that's my that's my kind of area so uh as you can imagine in british churches and churchyards there's no shortage of weird gothic spooky stuff really so uh so the book's kind of full of it really it's amazing you were saying in in last last this week last week i don't know where i am mm. anymore yeah last week with marietta marietta's program you were saying that these uh, fascination styles really at a very early age yeah. yeah when you were very young yeah. so how how did all this started as um yeah, I, like I, I was kind of. Do you, do you mean my fascination with all this this stuff? Yeah, I see. Well, yeah. oh, I'm going to have to do something with this. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, as long ago as I can remember, really, when I was a child, I was kind of fascinated by kind of spooky places and ghost stories and weird legends. And I mean, you, you know a bit about Yorkshire. Yorkshire's just full of that sort of stuff. You know, you can hardly walk down the street without seeing some spooky old church or house or whatever. So um, I think it's maybe in our blood a little bit, you know, here in the UK, maybe especially in Yorkshire. And um, I, I always asked my parents to buy me ghost books, um, things like that. I'd read them avidly, be, be scared to death at night, <laughs> not, not able to sleep. <laughs> but I'd, I'd read them again the next day. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, um, I used to tell other children ghost stories as well and scare them and give them give them nightmares. So it kind of, I, I don't know why, it just goes back quite a long way. And 
maybe there's been parts of my life when I've, when I've been more interested in it, parts when I've been a bit less interested in it. But I think it's always kind of been there, you know, in the background somehow. Yeah. 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 So is um, when you, you decided I want to write, mm. when, when did you get this call? Uh, funnily enough, it was quite late for me. Um, I, I mean, I'm 46 now and um, oh, I, the same I, I got, age. <laughs> yeah, I got this um, urge maybe in my early 30s. So I started, I hadn't really had it before. I, I just suddenly got this desire to write when I was maybe like 31, 32 or something. Um, and I just started um, trying to write, you know, but I'd never done it before. So <laughs> obviously I wasn't that good. Uh, so I had to keep practicing and learning the, the craft you know, because there's so much um, craft to learn in writing. People people don't realise, they think it's all like inspiration, which is really, really important. But to make your inspiration come over well, you, you need your craft, you know. And um, I, I don't think you ever stop learning, really. You know, it's always, you know, plotting, character, um, language, all, all this stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm still learning now so, so much, yeah. you know. Um, um so yeah i just when i when i had time i just worked on worked on the writing you know i was doing other jobs as well i was teaching english so i didn't always have so much time but i just kept working and eventually i managed to um to write my first novel you know um and mm. um then um you know got into uh like blogging done a bit of non-fiction now i won a won a short story competition prize for go gothic um nice. competition in 2019 so uh oh. yeah it's kind of it's a journey it's a bit of a cliche isn't it but it's it, it, no. it's kind of it's a journey as you kind of learn your craft and learn more aspects of it i suppose and i'm yeah. still learning now yeah yeah no it, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying and yeah it might be a cliche but it's the truth isn't it yeah because yeah um, I, I interviewed last week, I interviewed uh, Tracy Fahey as well, mm -hmm. and her publisher, Justin uh, J.R. Park, and it's very similar, you know, the, yeah. the, uh, for, for some of us, it starts uh, really early, but you don't take it seriously, you know, I started mm -hmm. writing diaries, mm -hmm. but um, that, that was just for me, and mm -hmm. you can tell, you, you have this feeling that you're still not ready. Mm -hmm. So, and you also leave it like on a, on one side. I think mm. we, most of us think, well, it's not like a proper job, although it is. It is. <laughs> we have this yeah. Of, it's not a proper job. It's just that, well, it's more like a hobby for a lot mm. of people. It's not being mm. uh, taught in the schools in the way maybe that other jobs have been, mm. or other jobs are really promoted inside uh, colleges and universities and even in the school, in the primary school. And... We, we came to that conclusion, the three of us as well, and that there's something that needs to be done because, mm. as you said, it takes a long time and it might be a bit lonely as well. Although nowadays writers get together and it's really mm. good when you see uh, people throwing ideas. Mm. And, but if you want, we can talk about more about this in the second part of the of the session because okay. you know, we, we move away. I have this tendency, you can see that in thrift. Very easily. So yeah, this this is. I mean, I think it's a it's a lovely cover. Yeah. Would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, what this is? Because it's one of like the main feature of the book, maybe. Um, what's on the cover? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is um, what's called the um, sanctuary knocker, and mm -hmm. it's um, like a, a a big door knocker on the door of Durham Cathedral in the northeast of England, and um, this is actually a, a replica of the originals inside in a in a glass case, but it's. Um, this is the replica of a medieval knocker. And basically, if people were fleeing from the law in, in the Middle Ages and they managed to, like, bang that knocker, they had to let them into the cathedral. And I think they got 37 days uh, of sanctuary where they could either, like, negotiate with their pursuers or go into exile. And um, during those 37 days, they were under the, the protection of the church. But oh, it's right. quite... It's quite an interesting story because that face is actually apparently based on the face of demons, which lived on um, the some islands called the Farn Islands off um, the coast of Northumbria. So apparently St. Cuthbert, who is like a famous early saint here in England, he banished these demons to the most outlying islands, but 
people could still hear their kind of hideous uh, shrieks and things like this. So um, apparently that, that door knocker is modelled on uh, the, the faces of these demons. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. great because, you know, we both like these dark creatures. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it reminded me of, when I saw it the first time, it reminded me of Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he, he, he knocks at this door yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Space and, and that description. Yeah, it, it changes into a face of Jacob Marley, isn't it, his old partner? That's right, yeah. that's yeah. right, yes. Yeah. So I, can, I don't know why I, ma I made that connection, I suppose, because I know that you write gothic and stuff and yeah. it just for me which was like automatic you know and i did i didn't know to what point maybe there was the, that inspiration there's just coincidence that is mm. one of the items that has this legend behind that's so interesting mm. it's very nice uh, obviously everybody asks you the same what is your favorite <laughs> your favorite discovery or legend and i suppose you have probably something that is more to your heart um or... it's um it's, it's really hard to say which is my favourite, but one one I especially like is um, in a church in a place called Frencham in Surrey, there's a, a cauldron. Like it oh, looks yeah. like a, a witch's cauldron just standing in the middle of a church. I, I wrote a blog yeah. post about it as well. And yeah. um, there's all kinds of weird legends connected with it, like um, some people say it was the uh, property of some local fairies. And... Um, uh, a man asked to borrow it and they lent it to him, but he didn't give it back on time. So they, they punished him by making the, the kind of tripod the cauldron was on uh, turn into legs and it pursued this man everywhere. <laughs> and eventually yeah. he fled into the church where he collapsed and died. And that's where the cauldron stayed. Um, another version of the legend says um, it was um, the property of a, a local white witch. And one day yeah. the, the devil tried to steal it. And she chased after him on a broomstick and eventually got it back and put it in the church for safekeeping. But it's a real um, interesting, like, tangle of legend. I mean, I've, uh, um, I, I can only mention it quite briefly in the book because it's a short book. But um, on my blog post, it's explored in more, in more detail. And it's, uh, it's really quite complex. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to go over that again because I, yeah. I sometimes forget details as well. But... Yeah, so so the cauldron is is it an object that for you is something that's always caught your attention? It maybe it reminds you of um, I don't know maybe TV programs that we watch more with kids, or you know the typical witch story. Yeah, but possibly. I mean, it's in a lot of cauldrons in lots of fairy tales and things like that, aren't they? So maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, also, it's quite interesting in like Celtic legend and things like this was lots of stuff about cauldrons and mm. magical cauldrons and cauldrons which can restore you to life if you die and um so there's that kind of mythological background maybe as well as the sort of um fairy tale background to cauldrons um yeah. yeah i don't know why i like the legend so much it's just there's just something so like funny yeah. and intriguing about it yeah <laughs> yeah the fact that yeah. it goes and it walks around doesn't it that, that's yeah, what I yeah. Thought, yeah 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 Again, it just think about these it, Disney cartoons when they were yeah. trying to talk about Merlin and and then they have all these walking things. Or even the Beauty and the Beast, you know, the all the magical um, objects that they have yeah. legs and they walk around. So maybe we have things there in the back of our head. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing I find interesting is that when I, I, I posted there is, mm -hmm. I, and I told you the other day as well in, in my other program, is the fact of the pyramid in the UK. Yeah. For me, it's like a mind-blowing because yeah. pyramids belong to egypt so mm -hmm. what the hell are they doing in the uk yeah. but the fact that this is also connected to vampires and and not, not this one not this one in this case but yeah <clears throat> the vampire tombs is another thing but mm. no because you have one in in i've got the book in front in in, in sussex the one mm. Yeah, that's a different pyramid. But this one that I, I rescued here, uh, it was funny because um, the guy who was buried there was from from Lancashire. And I thought, oh, look, there's a connection with my husband. So <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. But no, the fact that we have this one is in, yes, in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, is this one that is known as a vampire grave? Yeah, um, I'm saying right. No, it's not. Um, it's not He's not meant to be a vampire. Um Apparently his his ghost has been seen in this churchyard. That's right. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm reading um, something 
belongs to the previous one, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this pyramid tomb, um, the guy buried in it, um, there's legends that say he was a, a gambler and one day he played cards with the, the devil and lost his soul. So he's seated like upright in his pyramid, clutching a, a winning hand of cards. So the devil can't beat him and can't claim his soul. Um, and apparently his ghost has been seen in the churchyard and he's wearing like a, a top hat and a cape, like a typical Victorian ghost. And, um, you know, has this kind of lifeless fire lighting up his face and black eyes. And, um, yeah, a, a man who saw him was apparently so terrified he he died of shock. <laughs> um, wow. so, so, yeah, there's all these kind of strange legends around this pyramid. It's in, um, I think it's St. Andrew's Presbyterian Churchyard in Liverpool. Um, exactly. And um, But, I mean, I, I think the legends are built on a strange tomb because the guy who's buried there seems to have been a very kind of sober, hard-working, upright engineer. Um, so I think the, the legends um, kind of came from the, uh, the tomb itself because it does look quite sinister. Mm. Mm. And why, why pyramids do you think? Why pyramids in the UK? Or is it because of the, the shape? I think you developed this in one of your, your blog entries. Maybe the shape and the fact that it points to God. And maybe I'm inventing mm. stuff here. But um, it's kind of like the Egyptians that they had this idea as well. Of yeah, um, it's mainly because of something called um, Egyptomania. Um mm -hmm. I don't know if you have this in, in Spain, but in like a, a lot of Western European countries, um, when like the conquests of Egypt began and um, there were like advances in archaeology, so people understood ancient Egypt a bit better, um, people kind of became obsessed with ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, like in the sort of later Georgian period, Victorian period, early 20th century, there's this real obsession with ancient Egypt. So, you know, there were like Egyptian buildings being built on European streets and Egyptian jewellery and Egyptian things like cropping up in novels and stuff. And um, perhaps inevitably, it also influenced um, burial customs. And mm -hmm. you started getting these little pyramids in churchyards and cemeteries. And we've got quite a lot in, in the UK, actually, and for some yes. in Ireland as well. Um, I mean, I, I wrote a, a blog post about it. I wrote about 10, but there's like many, many more that I, I couldn't fit in. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, what you were saying about it kind of pointing to God and all that, um, I, I guess like people like Freemasons might have been interested in that sort of thing, the sort of symbolism of a pyramid. Um, I think with some people it was just fashion, but just like <laughs> ancient Egypt was fashionable. So they wanted a nice fashionable mausoleum, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Well, is, so if you, if you had to develop from every every object and every like the, the little monuments everything that you found if you had to develop all of them like properly as in more expanded and mm. how long do you think it would take you or, or which would you choose it will take you forever i suppose because it could you could expand as long as you as you would like to but mm. if you had to choose if you could go in depth because you were saying before that you were limited in words yeah. in the book yeah. and, and and I felt that I wanted more things there as well. Yeah, it's, but, it's not my fault. It's the, the word limit that my publisher gave me. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, we like to tell you, publisher, we need something hmm. more. We, need we already more. went way over. <laughs> <laughs> we need to see. No, well, it's, it's good because it's a guide. Yeah, I see it's yeah. just a guide of something that can be developed even further. Yeah. But if you if you could, like, develop a few of those, where would you go or which would you choose to go more in depth? Apart from the cauldron, the cauldron would be one, I suppose. Yeah. Cauldrons. Then what would be the others? It's a really um, difficult question. Um, I think potentially, like, each chapter in that book could maybe be its own book, you know, like um, yeah. the, the first chapter is about kind of pagan or possibly pagan survivals in British churchyards. And uh, but I think that could easily be a, a book, you know. There's yeah. probably enough material to to make to make it a book. Or um, did a chapter about holy wells that could easily yeah. be a book. I'm, I'm sure people have done whole books on holy wells, um, like churchyards. Yeah. I mean, one chapter is about churchyards. I mean, that, that could be endless. You could write endless books on churchyards and all the weird stuff in them. You know. Yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's 
it's, it's a fascination, I suppose, for, for Spaniards. Mm. We find fascinating the, the graveyard on the ground because mm. I don't know if you, when you were living here, if you actually went to any cemetery, but normally we have them more in walls and corridors. And yeah, it, it's like kind of shelves, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, buildings, basically, just yeah. buildings, and, and they are there. But I know also that, it, yes, it's true, because in, in the old churchyard, they, people don't bury family members there anymore because of mm. the space, because there was a law. I know that I was investigating that as well, and yeah. there was a law in the 18th century that was passed on. Well, they started in 1700, but then it didn't get really... Cemeteries mm -hmm. couldn't be really moved until later on because people were so engaged into having it there near the church. Yeah. Um, and that that was European. You know, it happened in Spain. Yeah. At the same time, it happened all over. Uh, but then we moved um, our deceased into these buildings. And I think in mm -hmm. the UK, you still have the graveyard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the ground. Still, that style still remains. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we have a few like catacombs and things like this, but yeah, yeah, mainly if someone isn't cremated, they tend to get buried in the ground and have a, a headstone. Um, it's interesting what you're saying because um, you know about the like the overcrowded churchyards and the laws being passed. Because we had something similar in Britain as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of city churchyards were getting really overcrowded and disgusting, so they banned burials in them and set up these like garden cemeteries on the outskirts yeah. of cities. So like um, Highgate Cemetery is a classic example. There were seven in London called uh, the Magnificent Seven. These yeah. are beautiful cemeteries like ringing what yeah. were then the outskirts of London. And of course, all kinds of weird legends grew up about these <laughs> these new cemeteries as well, you know, like yeah. Highgate and, and Brompton. Um, no, it's, it's yeah. weird. I, I found out when I was, I was doing the research on the cemeteries, um, I found out that he was, uh, what was it called? Mm, let me see if I find it now. Uh, but, 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 there was, even the, it had a name. Yeah, you were saying that people were, um, I, what is it now? I can find the Spanish one. Um, the Great Stink in London in 1843, in 1843 because of the smell that it, it, they were producing, it was even called the Great Stink. Mm. <laughs> they moved them outside on the outskirts uh, because also, yeah, the, the type of soil that you have over there, it says, you know, that it impeded the composition. But I mean, I think in Spain we had the same problem. We got pandemic because of of the smell and everything being so close mm. to the population that they had to be moved. And in France it happened as well. But it's interesting that uh, how the Victorians, yeah, it looks like they they had picnics on them and all sorts of things. <laughs> that could only happen in that time, right? It's just yeah, the Victorians were weird. I mean, I mean, uh, they they fascinate me because they were so just so weird. <laughs> um, I mean, one one custom that Victorians sometimes did when a relative died, they actually had pictures taken of them, like photographs taken of them posing with the person's corpse and. You know, I mean, to us, it seems really morbid, but to them, you know, photographs, I guess, were expensive and we couldn't have them so often and we wanted to remember their loved one or whatever. Yeah, that's something I need yeah. to investigate because someone, someone in my group, you know, I have a group called Gothic Size Me and I explain mm. to them all things Gothic when I can and try to make it weekly, but it's, sometimes, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult to get on time <laughs> with it. But, uh, yeah, if you remember, I don't know if you've seen, I suppose you have, but maybe you haven't, The, the Others, the film, The Others, mm. by Amenava, and, and the picture, the Victorian picture, I mean, the family is American, but it doesn't matter, it's that period mm. of time. Mm. where they took people of the deceased and they they even opened the eyes of the deceased sometimes yeah. I with the eyes closed and that's so creepy yeah yeah to us and yeah yeah they did that with babies they did that so it was like to immortalize the last minutes mm. of mm. before being buried mm. and i don't know have you investigated that or is it something that we have to um, write up I haven't investigated it in, in great detail. I just know it happened. I mean, maybe one day I'll write a blog post on it or something. Um, yeah, I'll give you yeah. one point out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep getting new ideas for blog posts all the time. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. no, it's, it's true. I mean, for every and because if you if you also um like in your case, if you're constantly investigating and doing research, mm. then ideas just come up really all the time. So how long how long did it take you to put the, the book together? Because I remember you telling me that you were writing these nonfiction and yeah. So it's been going for quite a while, is it? Um, it's kind of difficult to say because I was um, I was doing other things at the same time. So oh. I'd maybe be do a bit of research on the nonfiction book, and then do something else, then maybe write a chapter or a draft of a chapter, then do something else. I, I reckon maybe um, if you kind of take into account all the research, all the writing, all the editing, um, finding photos and stuff, may, maybe it was about four months altogether. Oh, it's not it's not that long, really. No, because it, it's quite slim. So um, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. How, how long did it take you to write the standing was that we're going to? Oh, <laughs> that was longer. That was um, again. I wasn't writing it all the time because sometimes I was, you know, working or whatever. But uh, that was about four years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's hope for me. <laughs> you know, name <laughs> writing here in so many things. Yeah. Right. So no, perfect. Very good. Let's move on to the next, the next part if you want. So people have okay. to buy this book. Yes, I. Yeah, you have to buy it. Yeah, no excuses. No excuses. No. If people like, a, you know, Spaniards with this interest in English witness and cemetery, yeah. like I do, and yeah, ghosts of the legend. Full of English witness. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. And, and I should say Scottish and Welsh witness as well. It's not just England. It's the whole of. Yeah. So um, yeah. Great Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, generally, it's the thing, you know, where we say English, but it's true, it's like very Britain. I, I have to be very careful with that at home, as you probably know, you know. You know, if it's Scottish, it's not English. It's, if it's English, it's not Irish. It's like, okay. Yeah. We tend to make these mistakes, Spaniards. We tend to say everything yeah. is Great yeah. Britain. And... <laughs> <laughs> so it's even a, ses a session, a lesson that I teach in when I teach languages. Yeah. This is a, yeah. a session. So this is the first book. I have to say this, you are the first Twitter writer I followed and oh, really? bought a book from. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> because you. Because I yeah. like to, yeah, you have the, 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 you know, you're the first one in, in, mm. this, in this quest of mine as well. Yeah, I was new on Twitter and I, I came across this book and obviously I was trying to post my own short stories and start getting a bit of, let's see what happens here with mm. my story. Do I have a a group of people that I belong to and it was just a moment of my life that I needed. I needed to do that um, because of for health reasons as well from mm -hmm. Alistair and I, I just kind of thought well this is something I need to do and uh, yeah this is the first book about here it is. I'm not yep. lying. That's it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, it was great because yeah I thought well let's let's read you know you always read the, the blurb and and, mm. and I thought right yes we have modern gothic we have death you know fascinated mm. about death as you can see with the cemeteries and all these mm. uh, we have haunting haunted things like a pond haunted ponds mm. ghosts curses I mean I I read the blurb and I read the first chapter because it's is there I don't know if it's still there for free the first few pages of the book in your blog. Uh, yeah, it's on the website somewhere. You can read the first chapter or, or you can read it on Amazon as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, yeah, I like that. So then I went and I bought it. Mm. And and it keeps coming back, you know, it keeps haunting me, this story, because... To this day it haunts you. <laughs> it's just, I suppose, because I lived in West Yorkshire for a while mm. as well, mm. and then the landscape was mm. really familiar to me. And and I keep asking you, where is this place? Ah, you have to guess. Uh, obviously, it's invented, but yes, is 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 it based on a real place, or is um, it just a mixture of? It's um, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it's exactly a real place. It's uh, kind of somewhere in Yorkshire, let's say, um, somewhere in the, the flatter bit of Yorkshire, not <laughs> the hilly bit. bit, not the pretty bit. It's the flat bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah. somewhere in the mists of 1980s Yorkshire, yeah. So how yeah. much, this is another question you're going to hate me for, but mm. how much of your life experience or things that you've heard around you since you were a child is in this book? Because obviously 
there are some moments that are really tense and mm. even suffocating. Mm. And, and the repetition of certain actions in the book uh, and events, that's what really gets you into this oppression yeah. that the Gothic is characterized for. Mm. And you do that very well. And at some point I was like, oh, come on, David, this is too much. Uh, but yeah, I think it was necessary. It was necessary to have all that part. I don't want to give any spoilers. Mm. Mm. To then get to the end that, that it gets to. So how much of all this is yours? Because I've seen something that you lived or experienced, or is it just because of an article that you read? What what, what does the story come from? What is the what is the origin? Um, I, I should say it's I mean, it's fiction. It's not meant to be memoir or autobiography or anything like that. Um, I, I think sometimes when you, you write, you maybe start off with some point from real life, maybe mm -hmm. something you've heard or something you've experienced or seen, someone you know or whatever. Um, but I think as the story develops, it kind of, um, it, it can't be too much like real life because real life is generally speaking, not like novels, you know, because novels have this kind of plot, this like plot arc. Uh, my, 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 that novel isn't the tightest plotted novel in the world, you know, but still it's got a sort of basic plot arc, you know. Uh, whereas I think for most people, real life is a lot more kind of random, you know, it's like stuff happens for no particular reason or like bits of life might be really boring or whatever or just sort of mundane, same stuff day after day. And you, you don't really want to put that in a book because it's, you know, it's not so interesting most of the time. So you may be taking like little bits from real life and kind of fictionalizing them, you know, putting them into a plot arc. Um, like with characters, you might begin with a, you know, vaguely basing a character on someone you know or a mix of people you once knew or whatever, but soon the characters take on their own life and sort of become their own people, really. Um, so kind of... I think maybe readers sometimes have too much of a tendency to think that writers have lived or experienced the things they write about. I mean, they might have done to some extent, but yeah. pretty soon the needs of a story kind of take over and um, you uh, you got to kind of make it work as a story, you know, which yeah. is like pretty, pretty different to real life most of the time. Yeah. I mean, occasionally, like when I've been doing the, the blogging, occasionally I, I write about somebody and I think, yeah, this guy's life was like a novel, you know. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> the blogger wrote about Dante Gabriel Rossetti. I don't know if you read that one. It's um, this this guy had a life like a, a novel. It was incredible, but mo most of us don't, you know. Most of us, our lives are less interesting, and uh, so you, so you got to do quite a bit of invention, you know. Um, I mean, having said that, you know, I, I grew up in a small village in Yorkshire, and you know, maybe in some ways it was a little bit like one in the book, but. Uh, you know, like, like I say, you know, you, you've got to really, like, invent a lot of stuff on top of real life to make a book work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose for me it's a little bit different because I, I I did experience so many different things. I've experienced so many different, mm. um, let's say, extreme or scary moments in my yeah. life because of I, I travelled and then... Yeah. I kind of went through, you know, my, my, my relationship with with men and even with friends. There's always been, I think I, I've called the weird. So Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I mean we, we've all had weird and scary moments. I mean, I, I've had them too, you know. Um, so you know, in, the, in the story somehow, have you brought any of those in this book? Um, mm, Maybe maybe, yeah. to some, maybe to some extent, but like I say, you got to kind of yeah. take, maybe take something that happened and sort of build on it and make it maybe make it work in a fictional context, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But as you write, the book kind of takes on a life of its own and sort of almost it's not like you're directing it; it's more like you're listening and yeah. you're saying, "Okay, book, what do you want to do now? Tell me." <laughs> and I write it. I write it down. Oh, that's interesting. Wasn't expecting that, you know. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love when, when writers say that. You know, I, I listen yeah. to many interviews as well from the the um, Sinister Horror Company mm. uh, and and the podcast. And when just in his interview with writers, uh, most I would say them 
almost every single time there's a moment where the writer says, well, at this point, the book took over or the characters yeah. took over. Yeah. And I've noticed that that can happen because, yeah. you know, it, it, it has kind of happened to me as well, though I, I put a lot of what I've experienced mm. in there. Mm. And then obviously mm. I just kind of transform it and exaggerate. Or, or, as you said before, you're not going to put the boring stuff because yeah. then people will go, uh, what's this? Uh, but it's true that sometimes, and it's like magic or ghostly, yeah. And it's yeah, weird. Yeah, it is. It's like, um, you know, like athletes say about being in the zone, you know. It's a bit like that. You're kind of in a slightly different sort of – I mean, I don't want to sound too pretentious or anything, but it's like a slightly different kind of consciousness, mm. you know. It's not like your normal everyday consciousness. And sure. I think that's when the best stuff gets written because, like, I'm writing a book of short stories now, which I intend to give away with uh, for people who sign up to my email list. And I was kind of really struggling. I was like – it's, yeah. just, it's not happening for some reason and then I, I started this new story a couple of weeks ago and i'm like hey it's, it's happening it's coming it's you know and i think what it was was i was being too kind of strict before i was being too kind of it's got to be like this it's got to be oh. like this it's got to you know the plot arc's got to go like this and the characters have to be like this and blah 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 and kind of when i stopped worrying so much and just started kind of listening yeah. I mean, it's still first draft, so maybe maybe I read it back and think it's rubbish. But 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 I, I get a more positive feeling about it because it's you know it's more maybe organic in a way, just kind of you know. Whereas I think if you get too kind of um, you know uptight about it and thinking it has to be like this, it has to be like that, I think the quality gets worse. You know, yes. whereas if you're more more open to just what the story wants to be, yeah. I mean, you still need all your your craft or whatever, but. You know, if you have that op openness to the story, um, I think it tends to be better. Yeah. Yeah. You you know, like like as as teachers, I'm going to change this the screen mm. now. As as teachers, we say um, we'll come back to a paragraph of the book later. We tend to say uh, to our students, uh, when you are doing a writing, make sure that you organize your writing first. You do your brainstorming. Mm then you make sure that you know your initial paragraph is and where your middle paragraphs are going to be in your conclusion. I'm wondering recently how many writers who actually prepare the story like that. I mean, mm. this is what we preach. But mm. then I like, like you say, sometimes you sit at the PC and you have a story in your head, an idea, you start with a phrase because it comes to your head and you just don't plot, you don't do anything, you just write. Yeah. I, it's, it's a really great question, and I, I wish I could give you a definite answer, but I, I can't because I honestly don't know. Um, I, I think with shorter fiction, it might be worth just um, – it's called pantsing in the – that's a technical term, as in <laughs> flying by the seat of your pants. Um, <laughs> with, with shorter fiction, it might be worth pantsing it, just, just kind of write, just see what happens, see what you come out with. It probably needs a lot of editing, but just just go for it. With novels, I'm maybe a little bit more cautious because what if you write a novel and spend two years on it and look back and it just doesn't work? I I, I don't know. I've only written one novel so far. Um, I think The Standing Water was a, a bit of a mixture of um, pants in it and being a little bit more structured at the same time mm -hmm. and loads of rewriting as well. Um, so I... I don't know. That's a question I, I often wonder about. You know, should should we just go for it? Should we try and plan a bit more? Should we do something in between? I'm, I, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm, no, I'm kind just, of still learning. Yeah, it's just a curiosity, you know, because we yeah. always say these to the students to for, to make sure that they get a, a decent writing that is mm. coherent. But then the truth is that mm, when you're writing, you kind of let it go. And if mm. you before, if you if you constrain too much. Mm. The story sometimes that's why it doesn't really happen because yeah. maybe at that moment that you're writing the story yeah. is taking you to another direction. Yeah, like what I was saying about my my struggles earlier. I think I was kind of constraining too much. I was trying to control it too much instead of just letting it kind of come in its own way. Um, and often when stuff comes in its own way, I think it's better and more original. And I mean, I I, I used to do a kind of um, game with a, a friend of mine who's also a writer and we'd we'd just go to a bar or something have a beer sit down and we'd just come up with words just like the most random words you could imagine um you might just say like ceiling or someone might say um i don't know 
beer mat or, you know, um, and then someone might say something crazy like, um, I don't know, like circus tent or something. And you, you just write them all down and then you like try and write a story really quickly mm. using as many of the words as you can. Uh, and actually my, my story, which won, won the, the prize, actually came out of that exercise. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, I, I, I like massively edited it and changed some stuff, but, but the, the basic idea of it, it came from one of those sessions, you know, wow. just after a few beers, brainstorming some weird words, trying to make them into a story. Yeah. yeah. Basically when you're more relaxed and you're not worrying about yeah. is this grammatically correct even, or is, yeah. are people going to like it? You're just being you and you're just coming out with yeah. the story. Yeah. And the, the more unusual ideas kind of get through somehow with that kind of word association, you know. Um, yeah. I think Freud did something like that, didn't he, word association. So it's yeah, probably triggering so. something psychological or, or something, yeah. Yeah, because in a way, yeah. it's, it's, we, we just kind of get rid of all the, um, you, you know, we have the e, the the eat, the ego, and the super ego. Yeah. And you kind of let the eat do whatever it wants. Yeah. So in that sense, there's no filter. We don't have, yeah. I mean, at the moment we're filtering reality or constantly we're filtering out where we're just mm. like following the rules. But when yeah. you write yeah. in, you write fiction, there's not really rules apart from making it no. coherent. No, no, no. So, I, 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 I don't like it when people talk about rules in fiction. I think, I think there may be guidelines, maybe things that mm. tend to work and tend not to work, but they're, they're absolutely not rules. They're, no. they're just basic guidelines, yeah. Uh, you just you made me uh, made me go back in time when and mm. think that when you used to do this with with words, which is, it's a very good activity. I think I should try to yeah. do that with my kids in class. and see, bring some together and see what happens. <laughs> uh, but I remember when I was in, at college, um, one of my my friends and I, when we were we were super bored in the session. I mean, this is something that children don't listen to this or teenagers. Mm. This is not good practice. Uh, but we used to be really bored and then we decided to to write and, mm. and, and that was kind of funny because we did that exercise of okay i'll write two lines whatever comes to my head i'll write two lines yeah. or three lines and then and then cover the first two lines and leave just the one word or the last line mm. uncovered for the other one to continue the story and i still have these stories yeah. i've kept them they are hilarious because they make no sense, but there was some kind of uh, line there, you know, some kind of storyline. Yeah. It, it was it was so funny because I mean, my friendship was super crazy. Uh, but then we had the two sides, and this is something that maybe uh, we did as a game. Mm. And I tried to put this exercise in practice in class, for example, with my my learners of English, and I realized how much things have changed. Mm. Um, they need this constant support of what am I supposed to write? It has to be like perfect and they don't really know how to express mm. um, ideas that are not constricted in, into anything. And, and they, kept, mm. they kept checking, they did that in, in last year in a class and they kept checking with the person next to them. What did you write? No, that's not the idea. The idea is just to continue, carry on. So do you think that nowadays when you were teaching people and uh, did you come across this problem or that there was a difference between the way they perceive their writing and the way we perceive our writing? Um, I mean, I've, I've never really taught uh, creative writing. Um, I've taught more kind of how to write letters or whatever, or reports. And that, that does tend to be kind of structured, at least in English mm -hmm. kind of structured and done according to certain conventions and I guess for maybe the, the average person, it's it's quite good. It's that way because it makes it easier to learn. Mm. But I think if you're looking at something more creative, um, I I don't know because I, I do wonder people who grew up with the internet, you know, because when we were kids, there's no internet. Mm. Might sound amazing to people now, because um, I feel nowadays I'm I'm so surrounded by media. You know, I'm so. You know, it's, it's just everywhere, isn't it? Like yeah. mobile phones, internet, newspapers. You go to a station, there's a big screen with the news on. And I, I even went to a pub a while ago and we had like screens on the table with news oh. on. And you couldn't even turn them off. It was, it was just horrible. And, you know, oh, you, know you, do, you do wonder, is there like space for creativity now? 
you know, with all this media saturating the whole environment all the time. Um, I mean, I, I hope there is, but I, I do wonder sometimes, you know, um, because like when, when I was a child, you know, like we didn't even have TV all the time. Like <laughs> there'd be times when the TV would just go off for four hours and you'd have to do something else. And, That's right. you know, so I, I think that maybe encourages your creativity a little bit more when you've got to make up your own entertainment or whatever. I sound like some like old 80 year old guy or something saying this, but, <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah. No, but it's true. I mean, they, yeah. have, they, they are creative in different ways, but mm. it's true that this, this exercise that I'm telling you about, uh, mm. I did it last year, and I have done it every year since I opened my language mm. school mm. 10 years ago. And the initial years, people were laughing, and I'm talking about teenagers, they were laughing, they yeah. thought it was hilarious. And last year, so in, in, in the space of time of 10 years, mm. this has changed. I don't know if it was that group in specific. Yeah. I mean, I only had like nine or 10 kids. It's not like I have a big sample to say, well, this is what's happening. Mm, mm. But I saw a change in, in even like, I don't know, I read the other day that we're going, we, we're growing more and more stupid, you know, maybe the IQ level is going down the pan because yeah. we're not thinking, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, this thinking that you're saying and we're not thinking. Mm, mm. Uh, and also like technology solves so many problems for you, doesn't it, as well? You, you don't need to use your brain to work out little problems you can just get an app for it or whatever so true. yeah true. maybe it's having a bad effect in some ways having said that i'm always on the internet constantly and <laughs> i'm a complete are. internet addict and i work on the internet so yeah no we all are but yeah. i think it's to know how to use that yeah. to, not to make you more stupid but actually to make mm. you work faster mm. and and have this access to all so much information this is great because before mm. You would have had to go to a lot of libraries to find about these churches and about all these mm. elements and all these curiosities and and mm. travel. Yeah, and then nowadays mm. it's all yeah. uh, fingertips. I, I should say I didn't get it all off the internet. I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I did. Um, I did do uh, research with respectable books as well. But, uh, well, yeah. I might have actually a lot of old, lot of old books actually a lot of old yeah. books about folklore that I found here what and there. Find? What yeah. do you find them? Do you what do you find? Do you go to public libraries? What do you do? How do you put um, I found a lot in old charity shops actually. Oh. Yeah. Because you, you know the charity shops we have here in England, you don't really have them in Spain, I think. But no. we, we've got these shops um selling goods for like second hand things for charities and a lot of them have really good book sections and I found a lot of like old books about folklore and legend and myth in a lot of wow. these shops and bought them for couple of quid and um you know some of them found my, found their way into my book you know i mean of course i, I verified that what they're saying was correct but a lot of the the basic ideas came from these old kind of folklore books and like oh, from wow. written back in the in the 80s or 70s or whatever yeah did, did you actually get to interview anybody as well your... um i have to be honest i i didn't interview anyone myself some of the sources i used interviewed people so, you know, like about the, the cauldron, uh, there mm -hmm. were folklorists who were maybe doing research in the 50s or 40s or 30s, and they were interviewing local people and writing yeah. down the, the legends and things. So I kind of, I kind of like uh, nicked some of their, <laughs> their research and stuck it in my book. Um, I mean, there were a few things in the book which I, I knew myself just from having grown up in Yorkshire and hearing like my family or people in the community talking about like various weird legends because we've we've got loads of these like weird legends in this part of the world it's just full of it so you'd hear it's not like people were talking about it constantly you know but you just occasionally hear oh yeah you know that ghost that's supposed to haunt whatever you know oh yeah and then and start talking about what, what was on telly last night or whatever but but you know um you, you did hear this like weird stuff sometimes so um some of that yeah. i guess i guess made it in yeah yeah no, that's... and it, and into the, the standing water as well some some local legends got in there too yeah yeah i was going to say that yeah. like, like um i was going to mention that that right um i've got some points here in the book um where you mention a lot that's you know, as I thought when when I read these the the church church curiosity mm. now, it, it came to mind which was first. It's like chicken and egg. Which book came first? Because in this book, in the Standing Water, you mm. also make a lot of references to legends. Mm. You have birds. Let's see if I can get them all. 
So you have legends to birds and ravens in general, but you also mm -hmm. have, well, inside the church yeah, is this item that the kids are trying to collect yeah. to take revenge. Um, then you talk about another legend dancing around something in a ring who raise up her weird magic. That's another one. I mean, it's, it's full of it. Mm. Um, then you, you have like um, Scottish folklore there as well. Mm -hmm. Just trying to get, I mean, there are lots of references to, I mean, I, I've not kind of <laughs> categorized them all, but yeah. you do mention, I mean, I was really like, when I was reading it, I thought, I'm not just reading a, a story, I am learning, you know, this is the thing that when I when I pick a book and I like it, and I say, I really like that, it's because I'm learning about things that I didn't know about, mm -hmm. uh, these legends, uh, yeah, you talk about the stone circle as well. You mentioned Christianity. You mentioned, you know, all all these, yeah, um, yeah, all these elements that we see in just curiosities. But so you, yeah, you talk about Odin, that the Morrigan, and you know, I love the Morrigan. So mm -hmm. when I saw that, I thought, oh, yeah, this is I'm learning. I'm learning lots of mm -hmm. stuff from mm -hmm. these people, and I could just go and investigate more. So when you were writing, I mean, you wrote just curiosities after, but oh, yeah. Were they like kind of living together at some point, these two books? Um, well, um, funnily enough, I, I didn't really have an idea to write a non-fiction book. I, I was actually approached by um, my editor at um, my publisher's called Shire. It's um, like a subsidiary of Bloomsbury. And uh, my, my editor, Russell Butcher, just contacted me on Twitter one day and said, hey, do you want to write a book? It sounds crazy. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's like in some ways a writer's dream, like an editor yeah. actually contacting you and asking you if you want to write a book. You know, I mean, I, I sent so many letters to publishers and agents when I was starting out, got absolutely no yeah. response or just negative responses. And then a few years later, this guy just approaches me on Twitter and asks me if I want to write a book. And I think Russell, he, he liked my tweets and I think he mm -hmm. must have read some of my blog posts. I mean, I, I can't imagine him handing out a book contract if he hadn't read any of my writing. But um, yeah, so, so the idea was actually from the publisher, not from me. And but he said, you know, want to write a nonfiction book? And I was like, yeah, okay. And uh, you know, but I never really had a um, ambition to be a nonfiction writer. You know, I mean, I, I found out I do enjoy writing nonfiction, but I my my ambition was all, always more to be a like a novelist and a fiction writer. Um, so definitely, yeah, the Standing Water came first. And um, I'll tell you, it's quite interesting how it developed because I, I had a real stage on loving um, a lot of writers in the Spanish language. So like, you know, Garcia Marquez and uh, Borges, you know, the Argentinian writer. And when I, when I lived in Spain, I got really into like the poetry of Garcia Lorca and things like this. And I, I just oh, loved their kind of like this really vivid style and this sort of blending of like the factual and the, the magical together. Yeah. And my, my original idea was I'm going to write a magical realist novel, kind of a bit similar to Marquez, something like that, or, yeah. or Borges. And, but I'm going to set it in Yorkshire. <laughs> so, yeah. so I tried to write this magical realist novel set in Yorkshire and um, guess what happened? <laughs> it came out. It came out gothic. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so um, I think for gothic is our magical realism. You know, it's it's the magical yeah. realism of of English people. Um, so, um, but that's where I was like getting all these, putting in all these legends and ghosts and things. I was trying to be like a an English Gabriel Garcia Marquez or something, putting in all these sort of <laughs> weird legends and stuff. And, it's and, and, it, and I, I sort of realised, oh, I've written a gothic novel. <laughs> It's amazing, yeah, because yeah. You, are, you are there trying to do an English thing and it yeah. comes out, and it, uh, sorry, you're trying to do a Spanish thing and it yeah. comes out in English. And I'm trying to do an English thing yeah. and I don't know what's going to come out. <laughs> I, I was like, I was like, oh, I'm not going to write like other English people. I'm going to, I'm going to write like, you know, these sort of Europeans or Latin Americans. I'm going to get away from this realist English tradition, which I'm bored with. And uh, I wrote the most English book imaginable. <laughs> I just couldn't, couldn't have been more English. <laughs> oh, it's really, it's really good. No, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm there trying to do to bring the Gothic into Spain. Yeah, precisely what you're saying. We call it other things. We don't call it Gothic. 
Yeah. And and for us and for me, it was like a very recent discovery to realize that we do have Gothic literature in Spain. Mm, mm, mm. It's just it's called what you were saying before. Is it really is a um, what do you say again? Magical realism. Magical realism. Yeah. Exactly. Or we call it um, we call it what else? There are all the labels, but there's <laughs> one called Esperpento, and that I don't know if you come across the Esperpento, but that's probably the, coast, the closest to Gothic because mm. it's this dark rising. I mean, Esperpento is, um, it, it only lasted a few a few years. Mm. Um, I can't remember the name of the book. That's very bad of me. Um, but it talk, you know, the, <clears throat> the style of Esperpento is these dark descriptions of the lowest of society and it brings mm. the worst out of people you know like mm. the more mundane mundane uh, but it has that humoristic touch to the spanish we have yeah so even even when we have death in front of us we just laugh yeah, yeah. so that's it, yeah. that's what we call it like it's perpendicular you know because it's is this we kind of not take it seriously yeah no, I don't think Gothic's meant to be taken seriously. I mean, I I don't take it seriously. You know, it's it's got a humorous side, definitely. Yeah, well, yeah. it depends, isn't it? It depends on how. Mm. how what is your your background in the Gothic? So, do you actually study it as well, or it's just something that's just kind of come natural to you? Like, you um, get some people in academia that really. Yeah. I, I I don't think I've really kind of formally studied it. Um, it's more just kind of picking up um, what's around me in the, in the culture. So, um, you know, like some, some of it was like musical, you know, because uh, before I really got into literature, I was really into music and right. like kind of alternative music and stuff like that, like, you know, gothic music, um, maybe stuff like alternative metal and stuff like that. And um which yeah, which is like um, really, really gothic, you know. It's really like, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like it's so it's so gothic. Any any basically sort of, you know, like the the Seattle grunge scene, you know, like bands like Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, so so gothic. I just loved all that stuff, and um, you know, and like bands from my part of the world, like you know, Sisters of Mercy, you know, York, yeah. Yorkshire based band, you know. Um, I think the Mission were based in Yorkshire, so. Um, Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so so I sort of gravitated towards this kind of dark music, I guess, and then um, when you know um, you maybe get slightly beyond the age where you just want to go out and drink and hear music every night, you might start. <laughs> I start reading a bit more, and um, I started discovering like interesting dark, weird literature, like mm. I said before, like the, the magical realist stuff, and. Yeah. You know, I mean, re reaching back into the sort of English canon as well. There's like, you know, a lot of a lot of Dickens is so gothic. Yes, a lot, yes. of, a lot of Shakespeare's really gothic. You yes, know? yes, that's it. Um, we always talk about gothic literature. Yeah. In uh, the Castle of Otranto being the first one gothic book. But yeah. really, we, if you look at the ghost figure, for example, that seems to be in no man's land. It's not really mm. one for mm. another. Mm. And and. The ghost is very gothic in itself because it's in these borderlines. It's not yeah, here absolutely. or there. Yeah. Yeah. But when you look in the past, it's where you say you have Hamlet. We have a yeah. ghost there. Yeah. If you look at the um, Macbeth, you have the Cauldron and the Witches. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, and if you go, you keep going back and back. Mm. You already go back to the medieval medieval times where you have mm. the 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 presence of the ghost as a social figure. Yeah. Which is something that I'm really attracted to to know to know to see where it all comes from and, and which was mm. the first thing that we got us in in, in mm. ghost and in all this folklore. You know, is it just basic folklore because we needed to tell a story to entertain ourselves around a campfire? Maybe it's more to that, you know, maybe mm. it's got to do with the fact that people really see things, some people see things and what it seems to be like a story mm. a made up story there's more to it you know so for me gothic is a very serious thing gothic is yeah i mean i now you've said that i, I didn't mean to dismiss gothic as being kind of i don't know not serious i mean it's in in a, in a sense it's kind of funny and absurd in in another sense mm. it's like it's really deep because yeah. there's um 
you know, like, like you say, it goes to the absolute like roots of life and death, and literally, you know, where's the boundary between life and death? You know, yeah. or or so many social questions like position of women or whatever, or yeah. class, or it's. Um, I mean, that's kind of why I prefer gothic to like horror, because like I find horror actually fairly conservative in some ways. It's like, I mean, not all of it, but it's like restoring the sort of how things should be, you know, the, you, you defeat the monster and things are back to how they should be. Whereas gothic is more asking questions. True. Really disturbing questions about life, about society, about psychology. Um, yeah. which, to answer your earlier question, yeah, that's probably why I like it so much, because it's so kind of... It goes so deep and it's it's quite subversive in a lot of ways. Yeah. It makes you think a lot more. Yeah, the yeah. horror sometimes can be in this this borderline of uh, gore and maybe too much yeah. bodily imagery there. That <clears throat> okay, I, I like both. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm now yeah. reading some. Kind uh, of... I like some horror. Yeah. Yeah. I like I really like folk horror, for example. Yeah. 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 So no, it's it's interesting, you know, and and mm. I think in 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 this book in in the Sunday Water again, so the chicken and egg thing, so it, it really starts here, and then you developed your curiosities later on because of what you wrote here, because a lot of these folklore that appears is what you already knew, or is folklore uh, that you researched to do to write the book as well. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of it, I uh, I knew some of it, I researched. Uh, I think also trying to. Um, like promote the book as well i learned a lot of stuff like on on twitter um right. sort of tweets i sent out i mean it's, i don't necessarily have this massive bank of knowledge <laughs> which I, I like draw from for each tweet i you know a lot of it i learned myself before i yeah. send it out you know um or, or blogging you know i've learned so much blogging um yeah. uh so so i guess it kind of developed really i learned i knew some stuff before learned some stuff writing my book learned stuff sort of blogging and tweeting learned a lot of stuff when I was writing church curiosities. I mean, it's a slim book, but yeah. I, I, learned, I just learned so much writing it. Um, Information yeah. There, yeah. So I've got a little paragraph, a little paragraph. I had to chop it because I wanted more, but I always like to get, well, it's something I started recently uh, mm -hmm. to get the writer to read a paragraph. So okay, what, do my best. <laughs> what I've done, yeah, because yeah. it doesn't make sense for me to read it. Okay. Um, so I have a, I call this section a Tissot quote. Tissot quote. Oh, I, re I remember thing. this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think it gives too much away, but mm. I think it, it's very good because it kind of, you have a lot of what goes on in the book without giving as I said, many information away. So people, yeah. I want people to want to buy this book as well. So this is a way. Yeah, I, I want people to buy it. Please buy it. <laughs> Let's buy it. Let's buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but we have fun, don't we? I mean, when we yeah. write, we love it. And and if if someone actually benefits from this as well as entertaining themselves, as I said, I was learning a lot about folklore. Mm. And for me, yeah. that was like a, a double game because it was, okay, mm. yes, I'm entertaining myself. I'm... I can see examples of gothic here all over the place, yeah. but also I'm learning things I didn't know about. And mm. because it's an area I lived in and I have a past there, I kind of liked it, you know? So mm. yeah, obviously for people that, that want to learn more about this part of England, that we always think England, London, you know, Spaniards, mm. we do, oh yeah, you've been in London. I don't know how many times I said to people, no, I lived in the North. I did, I've not even even been to London. Have you been to Madrid? No, me neither. And we're in Spain, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, There's also so much, so much gothic stuff about London as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, I've never yeah. been, but in the north, yeah. I've, I've seen what the north is like, and I can see why the, there are so many ghost stories. Or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just starting with the the, the 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 setting, you know, we're saying that my, I I lived um, next door to a cemetery, uh, so it was like for me, it was like oof, the cemetery is just there when I every yeah. morning when yeah. I leave my house, it's just there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I didn't feel uncomfortable. I felt like something else, but weird. For for me, it was weird. So you got some so, kind of weird vibes from this the cemetery. No, I I think yeah. I. 
that's the thing that I I I wish I I would have had this. Mm. I mean, I've written about it and I've researched it, but I don't mm. find much inform. I can't find much information. I probably would have to go there and go to the registers and find out about local ghost stories about this mm. cemetery in in concrete. But uh, at the time I went there, um, I have to say the family I lived with were more scary than the dead. So right, okay. <laughs> I think it is that if one day I write about that, which I've already said in some stories, I will not say names, but okay. they were weird, man. They were weird. Maybe they, they were, were weird because of living next to a cemetery. They were yeah. maybe, maybe that's yeah. why. Maybe that's why. Hey, don't give me ideas now. Maybe that's why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is it okay the size of the screen? Can you read that properly? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'll do okay. my best. Yeah. So there we go. All yours. Okay. I'd want the rain to hammer, um, sorry, I'll start again. I'd want the rain to hammer for so long that no, the whole road. I just noticed there's an arm missing, sorry. So, yeah, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. Okay, shall I start? Yes, please, sorry. I'd want the rain to hammer for so long that the whole road would be carried off, along with the gravel beneath, till that downpour had scooped out the old shape of Marcus's pond. Down the rains would bash, day after day, until that pond, inch beyond its boundaries, started flooding the whole town. The hated school would disappear beneath the water, as would the stinking pub, Davis's shop, with its peevish old owner trapped within, or the houses, with all the savage gossips of Emberfield stuck inside. The flood would go on rising, till the entire town was swamped, till the waters lay over the realm of Salton, far above the church, the castle, the drummer's tunnel, above the sleeping Scots, above any ancient curses that drifted there. The rain wouldn't stop, the waters would get higher, until the whole country was covered. I'd imagine Whirton clinging to a Scottish mountain top, his face red, sweating, his eyes blinking behind his glasses, as the water lapped at his shoes, then his legs, his neck. On and on the rains would fall, the water would rise, until everything and everybody lay beneath. Swooping hands, bawling kids, Squabbling children, swinging belts, blabbering mouths, beating fists. Just endless calm waters, like in the beginning of the world, as the vicar had told us, before God had conjured the creation and all our problems had started. Nothing but featureless, perfectly serene, standing water. There you go. Thank you. Now when I read it again, I'll have your voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It sounds okay, actually. I, I was kind of thinking, oh, am I going to say, oh, I, I do this differently, I do that differently, but no, it, it sounded good. No, yeah. It's, it's yeah. a very good part. I mean, it's towards the yeah. end where we're getting really now close to, obviously, these these the main character protagonist is growing up and, and it's looking mm. back. And, yeah, I think you, you wrote a couple of wings to the reader's work because he writes, the main character as an adult, yeah. he writes. And and then you say this thing about don't make it not making much money from from writing. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. And no, but it's uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's got a lot of elements, gothic elements, as you were saying. I mean, and and this doubt, right? This doubt is is it really true? Mm -hmm. Because we have kids, the characters are kids, and yeah. how much are they making up? How much is true? But precisely because they are kids, they can actually see the reality in ways that the adults don't. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it made me quite anxious at some point. I was really anxious about this. This, this mm. character is Mr. Wheaton is horrible. Did you actually, is this based on a real person you met or you just created this because, I don't know, where does this character come from? Because he's really horrible. Well, I mean, like, like I was saying, you might start off with um, a kind of amalgamation of maybe people you've, once known or heard about or whatever but you know as the story develops the person has to like the character's got to take on their own life and their own personality and um you know you got to sort of invent a life of a person which works in the book so he, he kind of developed you know he's wow. kind of evil but i hope i hope not entirely without sympathy i know he's an evil guy but i kind of you yeah, know. I know what you mean. Yeah, some, yeah some I hope you felt at least a tiny bit of sympathy for him sometimes. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. A trouble, it's a troubled man and it's incorporated yeah. in, in, a, in, a, in a, an ideology that is not really healthy. Yeah. Uh, and I have to ask, it, 
<laughs> maybe at some point is this how english schools were in the past that is strict with they um could be crazy like back in the um like 60s and 70s um right. and maybe in some places it kind of carried on in into the 80s as well um yeah. but yeah i mean i mean 70s were kind of 60s and 70s kind of notorious for kind of crazy oh. crazy oh. schoolmasters and brutality in schools and yeah. all so kinds of horrible stuff of going on and yeah yeah there were a lot of beatings also this physical part about beating yeah the yeah, yeah 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 is, is yeah kind of physical punishment psychological humiliation yeah. i mean i mean you know that famous pink floyd song um, yes you don't need no education i mean exactly and that video i mean that that is based on <laughs> what it could be like I, i'm not saying all schools were like that i mean some were probably fine you know was with, with really nice good teachers but but some were you know mm. pretty pretty brutal places yeah yeah there's nothing that you didn't experience any of this you were at a time where all these had gone away or you kind of had some of these as well there, there were bits of it lingering on yeah yeah um I mean, I'm not saying that my childhood was like the childhood of the kids in the book, because like I say, you know, it's, um, you know, the character kind of takes on their own life, develops and certain things happen to them, which, you know, might not happen in real life because real life is more random or more routine or whatever. But yeah, there were kind of wisps of that sort of thing around still. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, well, sometimes yeah. the reality, you know, that's why yeah. I was thinking this really something that, it could have happened to you or someone you knew and mm. in a way it's like you are um voicing these mm. behaviors and and these actions mm. which is also something that books do that they just tell a story that maybe did happen and it's a you know we, we expose it so hey this serves as an example not to do mm. and mm. this is mm. how it really was and this will actually explain certain behaviors after that as well so I'm always into the whys and, and how it can benefit the reader or informing or otherwise. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, that's why I had all these these questions, you know, it's not necessarily that it happened to you, but yeah. some, some writers say, well, I just write and there's no really an intention. Mm. Uh, I just do it because I, I like it. I just had this book inside of me. I need to get it out. Yeah. And for, for some others, uh, well, I'm trying to send a message, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing about messages is um, I, I can't. I was thinking of this quote today. I can't remember who said it, but there's some writer who said, "Think about what what message you want to convey, mm. and then do everything you can to avoid actually saying it." So, yeah. so the idea is you you don't kind of preach to people. You let the story tell itself, yeah. and hopefully they'll they'll get the message, or they'll yeah. figure out the message, because. Um, I think that tends to make it more interesting for the reader. You know, it's not like someone's like bashing away, you no. know, you, this is how it should be. This is how you should think. But the kind of thing, well, this happened and this happened. Is, is the writer trying to say that, you know, yeah, well, we, sh we should do this or shouldn't do this? And yeah. I mean, then again, there are some books which are really preachy and are really good. Like, um, I don't know if you've read um, Tolstoy um, Resurrection. No, I haven't. Now, that, that's like really, that's like a manifesto. It's really preachy. Yeah. But it's actually a really good book, you know. Yeah. Um, but maybe, maybe Tolstoy could pull that off, you know. Maybe a lot of writers wouldn't be able to. Yeah, well, it depends yeah. on, again, I think it depends on the, the culture and the voice mm. of each country and each culture. They have this, like I was telling you about this perpento before, that maybe in Spain mm. we have these, always these humoristic touches that nobody takes us seriously for. Mm. And and then in other words, maybe in Russia you have this more preaching and more, if you think yeah. about the political structure of the country, it makes sense with that mentality. Yeah. Uh, but then his other books aren't, aren't preachy. So right. he, he just wanted to get his point across in resurrection. And yeah. I think yeah. he did it really well. And it's really yeah. preachy, but it's still really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. It's like I'm saying, there are no rules, you know, but just kind of things that tend yeah. to work on or tend not to work so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, no yeah. it's interesting. Interesting. Well, that's, that's very good. We're over an hour, David. We're talking yeah. about other things. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. It's yeah. good. No, it's good. Yeah. I, I am enjoying it too because we get into into all sorts of things and mm. the, the writer's mentality as well. Mm. Uh, you know, how different writers 
maybe follow different ways of writing. Mm. Uh, have you got like a like a routine, or do you have yeah, like? A... Um, I mean, what what tends to work for me is to um, like get down to it as early in the morning as possible. So mm. I get up at six o'clock. Wow. Get, get to work for seven, um, and uh, try and work until. I mean, hopefully, if nothing distracts me, <laughs> that's what I want. Try try and work, you know, with some short breaks until early afternoon. So maybe like half two, something like that, three. Oh, okay. After that, I'm I'm not so good. I, you know, sort of any any serious work I've got to get done in the morning or early afternoon. Yeah. I can maybe do more routine stuff afterwards, but but by, by early afternoon, my brain's kind of had enough and gone on strike, and yeah. you know, um, I've. Yeah, yeah, but I'm 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 much better in the morning, and yeah, so so it's like just try and get it done, yeah. you know, um, like half two, three o'clock, then I can relax a bit, you know. But um, do you have like do you have like a kind of um, I had the word and it's gone now. Do you follow like any rituals to like in specific plays or uh, with different depending on the light or you know, for example, like for me. Nighttime is the best time to read, obviously, because all my family is quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I have to keep it <laughs> kind of noisy. Uh, but then it's true that I find in the morning that your brain is cleaner. But for dark yeah. things, I also write at night. So sometimes at night I might read a bit, and then I'll write my own stuff afterward. Yeah, yeah some some people write better at night, and I, I kind of envy them in a way because I think at night there are less distractions, like you said. But oh. I, I can't do it. I'm just I'm better in the morning. I don't know why. Yeah. And do you need know, like um, a specific place, a room that you? Um, I like right to, room. yeah. I like to. I like to close the door. Right. That's. I think that's psychological. Just shut out the world. Mm. I also um, like to have the curtains pulled on the window, <laughs> which is quite funny because <laughs> in Yorkshire we've got a tradition that if if your curtains are pulled during the day, it means someone's died. So, <laughs> so probably, <laughs> probably all my neighbours think my relatives keep dying or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I like to shut out the world, just shut it out, you know, shut the door, shut the curtains. Um, then um, I like to lie on the bed and write because oh. I find if, if I sit at a, at a desk, uh, I start getting kind of stiff, you know, my, my body gets sort of tense and it's harder to write. But if I'm just lying on the bed, I'm more relaxed, so it kind of comes better. Wow. Uh, so I probably look. If someone was looking from outside, I'd probably look really lazy, just sort of <laughs> lounging on a bed. But yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's what works for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting yeah. because it, 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 different people have different mm. things that actually uh, trigger ideas better. For example, mm. as I say, for me, I suppose I connect nighttime with the writing, with the ghost, with the gothic, yeah. and then. Yeah. Uh, I put certain music on the PC as well, depending on what I want to write. It might be yeah. like more dark, um, a symphonic, mm. or sometimes I just go crazy and whatever, you know. So we all have different routines. Yeah. Because also, okay. yeah. like I, I don't write to music, for example, that would that would just distract me. Yeah. yeah. Would you be singing to the lyrics? Do <laughs> you think? <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, that is it's brilliant! It's brilliant. So. We're getting to the end, so where can we find David? Let's let's see. For those who are interested in reading his blog and finding him and talking to him, writing to him, yeah, have Twitter. Yeah, I'd say um, don't don't go to Facebook because I, I, I hardly ever do anything on Facebook. Um, I'm not, yeah, I went uh, to the yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not I'm not a fan of Facebook, but yeah, I'm on Twitter, tweet almost every day. Um, and my my website davidcastleton.net that's okay, got that's my right. that's got my blog on and uh yeah. so um yeah lo loads of blog posts about um kind of the gothic the folkloric the dark the strange the quirky bit of stuff about literature and art as well like the darker mm -hmm. sides of art and literature it's all there so yeah. yeah so please come over to our website take a look at the blogs uh put all totally free <laughs> um yeah. my my books um you can find them on the website um also they're um on amazon as well um so if you just type the the titles into amazon they'll um yeah. they'll come up yeah and um 
yeah please buy my books please yeah, <laughs> and leave me good. leave me lovely reviews <laughs> they're good they're good i mean i, yeah. I have enjoyed it and as i said yeah. I, I, you wouldn't be here if i didn't enjoy if, yeah. if i didn't enjoy your your stuff because i'm kind of picky and selective mm. with my my with the people i follow and the people who follow me well with the people i follow uh you know i, I i'm going for specific profiles because mm. That's the kind of thing I want to learn. I want to be working on myself as well. So definitely, and at some point, I will be using some of your material uh, as well in the classes if I can. Because I have mm -hmm. to say that for my students, I was considering once, if you remember last year, to use, yeah. to use some of your material. But then I realized, as you said, that the vocabulary might be a little bit challenging for lower levels. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and also because it's quite dense. Yeah. Um, so when I find a proficiency that wants to really read, I will definitely uh, try to use that. I've been using other other writers' books because mm. they were shorter fiction or because they were short stories. So whenever you have your short stories, definitely because that's easier for someone who's yeah. learning to digest and you know for mentally having these breaks. I can read one story if mm. I don't like mm. it, there's another mm. one. But mm. with with a book, it's a little bit more more complicated. So what are you working next and the short stories? When are we going yeah. to be seeing um, that? In as soon as possible, I hope. Um, so I'm, I was kind of thinking of like this really, I had this really like long book of short stories and novellas mm -hmm. and stuff in my head, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to maybe do like kind of 10 short stories or what are called novelettes, which are sort of, slightly longer than short stories, put them together in a book, uh, give it away on the website for people who sign up to my email list. And um, then the thing is, I've got lots of other kind of ideas for short stories and novellas or short novels. So after that, I'll try and put out some more like short story collections or mm -hmm. novellas or short novels. Um, so I was a bit kind of I think I was a bit kind of blocked for a while, you know, like I was telling you, I was maybe being a bit too kind of rigid with my approach and hopefully now I can, I can like write some stuff a bit more quickly and get some more. I want to get a lot more books out. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, doing, doing the blogging, that takes time as well, you know, it does. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully I can it does. But get some get new, new material out soon. Yeah. Yeah, and no, sometimes yeah. by blogging as well, you see also if people uh, comment on the blogs and that gives you ideas as well. So mm -hmm. sometimes you decide, well, this time I'll do this or I do, I'll do that. One. Well, yeah. um, the the blogs have inspired a lot of um, these ideas I've got for short stories, actually. Oh, so, yeah. so um, like you you read the uh, prize winning short story about like a possible ghost on the London Underground, and uh, That's I've, right. got, I love I've that. got a blog about ghosts on the London Underground and. Yes. Some of the other blogs, I've got ideas for stories from the blogs. So, I mean, hopefully there'll be a there'll be a kind of connection. Yeah. Like sometimes blogs can be a little bit um, eerie. There's nobody around. You're writing, and people go, "I like it," but there's no comments, and it's mm. a bit, so sometimes it can feel a bit lonely. You don't know who's really engaging with them. But then, uh, as, as you said, if if that's a good exercise anyway, because you can mm. reuse that somehow then is you're not really wasting well um time. you can see your traffic actually um there's like a yeah. little plugin you can use to see how many people are, are visiting yeah. the blog so yeah yeah in the wordpress you can do that yes yes yeah. very good very good so yes we're getting to to the end now so i'm gonna just show also for people who want to follow me look at me look at me <laughs> i've got thousands yeah. of, of things yeah you. follow but alicia yes I'm all over the place. I'm all over the show. I'm doing videos. Yeah. I'm doing all sorts of things. Yeah, she's uh, amazing. So she's on YouTube and stuff, and I'm I'm, I'm just on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, but look, it takes it takes a lot of time, and it's just like I'm testing and seeing what's yeah, best. Yeah. Obviously, it all gives you ideas, and you meet different people in different platforms, which is yeah. great. Yeah. So, and it's just testing the grounds and and everything, yeah. and so. Yes, please visit us, talk to us, talk to David. If uh, I will put all the links at the bottom of the video. So please, if anybody has questions, uh, they can send them to us and then we can answer to them. Yeah. We can reply, yeah. they can write to yeah. you, whatever. Yeah. I, I, always, I, always, I always like to hear from people, so don't, yeah. don't be shy. Yeah. 
exactly. Don't be shy. And you know, you've got someone here with a similar profile. We have a someone in language and literature, which is not mm. the common thing. And I think it's, it's like we are like this yin yang because you like my opposite. So <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of a great. Yeah. So yeah, perfect. Well, I hope you have enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's been, been great. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Really I, nice. I hope that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that next time that you have another book out or you have a project, we can talk again. Sure. And yes, so please le uh, like, thumbs up. I always forget to say this. So yeah. thumbs up, like, share everything, and good luck with the selling of the church curiosities. I think mm -hmm. it'll, that it keeps going the the, the way it's going now mm -hmm. or better. And that we sell some more of these. Let's sell yeah. some more stuff yeah. water. Because if you like gothic, you like ghosts, you have you like eerie, dark, moody places. You like um, yes, you have to. <laughs> you have buildings, you have legends, you have the lot here. You have everything, so please buy it. So well, thank you very much, and yeah, I'll see you soon. Don't go because I'll I'll stop the recording, okay. but then we can wrap up. Um, you know, behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, so, thank you very much, and. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.